Hello folks, welcome to the Hall Effect video. This is the 12th video of the New Electromagnetism V5 series. New Electromagnetism is the fourth book of ethereal mechanics. This video is being released to Patreon members 1 September of 2024 and it will be premiered on YouTube Thursday, 26 September 2024. Okay, in the previous video, I realized we needed to release some more material. So the beginning of this video is going to be an addendum uh, to augment the previous video. Then we're going to talk about what is the Hall Effect. And then we're going to show the new electromagnetism V5 derivation of the Hall Effect. Then we're going to talk about future Hall Effect experiments. And then we'll give you a Physics 2 software consideration. Okay, so the model of matter... I'm going to show you three things. I'm going to show you properties of different current structures. Fragmentary currents, line currents, and sheet currents. And that is going to be important along with the next item, which is the behavior of oblong objects. Using those two items, I'm going to show you more complete detail about how the two different types of MagnaView film work. And it's going to be really an eye-opener here. Okay, so let's begin this talking about different types of current, considering a fragmentary current. Here's a little piece of wire, a very small length of wire. We're considering only the small length. It may be part of a bigger loop. Doesn't matter. We're only considering the small length of it and the current that's in it. Over here, we have a current ring. This could either be the current ring of a magnetizable object or a paramagnetic material, or it could be a permanent magnet. Doesn't really matter. The only, those things really only different by the the current and the size of the loop. Okay, so when we consider the forces of attraction, we say that, okay, the light moving currents attract, which so the current on the top of the loop is going to be attracted to the fragment because their currents are in the same direction. And at the bottom of the loop, the current in the bottom of the loop and the fragment are going opposite directions, so these are going to repel. So the net force acting on this ring because you've got equal and opposite forces, the net force on this ring is going to be zero at this particular orientation. However, if we look at the torque, torque is force times lever arm. Well, we have a torque pulling in this direction around this axis, and then we have a torque pushing around this axis. So both of the torques are working to rotate the magnet clock counterclockwise or the current ring. If I say magnet, I mean current ring. It could be either or. Okay, and that is a torque. So this is a maximum torque, but zero for, force. Okay, now what's going to happen in a few, in, in a certain amount of time is this ring is going to magnetize. It's going to move such that the torque goes to zero now. And in this point, now that the torque is zero, the attraction force is going to be maximum. Because see, this edge here is actually closer to this, so the force is going to be greater than the repulsion force on the opposite side. So this magnetization will put this ring in a position for maximal attraction to the fragment. So we're going to be talking about two things, magnetization, which is a torque, and attraction, which is a force. So the force on the first fragment are going to be all of these variables multiplied by the inverse square of the distance between the two. And likewise, the force on the second fragment is going to be all these variables times 1 over the inverse square of the distance from the source to the target. Now what we're going to do for simplicity is we're going to wrap all these nasty, messy constants up into variables. Okay, we still say that the force, and this should be the force on either target, is the sine times all those nasty variables all wrapped up divided by the inverse square of the distance between them. So the force on the first fragment can be reduced to this. The force on the second fragment can be reduced to this. Next, we compute the attracting force from those by summing the attractive force of force 1 plus force 2. We do all that, blah, 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 blah. And we're going to use the variable A right now, temporarily, just for this video, to represent the attracting force. And that works out to the all those nasty constants wrapped up into this W. 
okay and then the geometric relationship is four times the radius divided by the distance to the center of this ring cubed cubed so the attraction force is an inverse cubed relationship from fragment to fragments now this is a simplified from this because what we're saying is that the distance is much much greater than r that's why we get this simplification the simplification is all we need to explain what i want to explain here so next we're going to compute the magnetizing force and we're going to give this the variable m uh, and that's going to confuse us later because we're going to use m for something else later but right now we're using it as the magnetizing torque if i say magnetizing force i really mean magnetizing torque Okay, that's why my brain is going to cross those words up a lot. I apologize. And so what we do is we add up torque 1 plus torque 2. Okay, torque 1 is force 1 times the lever arm of 1, which is going to be the negative radius here. Torque 2 is going to be the force on 2 times the lever arm. Okay, so the magnetizing for the force that's keeping this here. Now, there really should be a sine or cosine here. That's okay. We're not going to worry about that right now because as this goes to flat like this, the torque actually goes to zero. So this is the representative of the magnetizing force. So we're going to add those all together. And so our magnetizing force, this would actually be the force if the ring were still vertical. Okay, that's really what this means. Okay, and so the magnetizing force or torque is all those variables times two times the radius of the loop divided by the distance squared. So the magnetizing force is an inverse square relationship. Because of that, it's a little bit more powerful than the attractive force, which is only an inverse cubed relationship. Okay, now we're going to put these all together, and we're going to create a nice chart of all three of these. I'm showing this. This is what we just discussed here all together. Again, you can see that the attracting force A is an inverse cube relationship, and the magnetizing torque is an inverse square relationship. Hold on to that. Now we're going to go into a line current. So if we take a line current, and this current extends very, very, very far to the point where as it gets longer, it doesn't really affect this ring much more. Well, we can compute the uh, attracting force. Oh, we're going to wrap all the constants for this one up into an H. Okay, and so the attracting force is 2 times the radius divided by the distance squared. So you, you notice now that the attraction force is a little bit better than the fragment one because the fragment was inverse cubed. Well, we have a chart at the end. I'm going to show you these all together. All right, this is the magnetizing force. Okay, then with sheet current. So we basically have a wall of current, current all moving in the one direction. And this the size of the sheet current is much, much larger than this current ring. And that gives us a simplified approximation because when you do that, the force from this sheet current is the same at force 1 and at force 2. It's not affected by the distance. So, And then we're going to wrap all of these constants up into the big variable S. So your, your force is a constant of those variables S times a sine based on which way it's going. And so we see here that the attraction force for this situation goes to 0. Because the force is the same on both sides, but they're in opposite directions. And therefore, when you sum them, they cancel to zero. And this is for an infinite sheet current here. You get zero. But, you know, we're, we're never going to have an infinite sheet current. If we have a pretty big sheet current, it doesn't have to be that much big where the attraction is almost approximately there. You can ignore it. You can ignore what's left over. Okay, the magnetizing force, though, is very powerful because... Um, it's not affected by distance. So your magnetizing force is two times all those nasty variables times the radius of the loop. Okay, so let me show you the wrap-up. These are all of the things for the fragment. These are all the things for the line current. These are all the things for the sheet current. Now we're going to talk about these, but the more important one I want you to look at right now is that the attracting force for a sheet current is essentially zero. Now we're going to come back to this in a moment. Now we need to get into the behavior of oblong objects. So this picture, though, is of magnets. They make a lot of magnets with this shape. I couldn't find anywhere where I could just get a piece of steel or iron that's shaped like this. 
Okay, so that's one of the problems. We'll show you how we're going to have a little stand-in using a nail. So if we had an oblong shape, uh, it's going to develop a image of the edge current around this long axis here. But because currents like to take the shortest path, that edge current is going to want to edge up to go to kind of reduce the radius that it's moving. And because of that, the point of this object is going to be pushed away from the edge current. And what's going to happen is this object, if you, if you held it there, allowed it to rotate, but didn't allow it to attract, it would actually go and present its narrowest aspect toward the edge current. Again, it'll push the points away, but it'll attract the, the section that has the narrowest current going around it uh, if, in magnetization. And again, your magnetization has to do with the radius. The sheet current wants to go toward the smallest, but your magnetization wants the largest ring. So you've got this battle that's going on with these objects. And you can see that battle, that if you let this object go, how it's going to be attracted to the magnet. It's not going to be directly at the center, and it's not going to be at the point. It's going to be somewhere along the shaft, because remember, the radius, the attractive force is based on this radius. So the bigger radius will have more of attraction. Okay, but the sheet current wants to go toward the smallest point. So you're going to have a balance between this section here, which is the point of most attraction, to this point here where the sheet current wants to go. So you're going to get a balance somewhere in the middle. So you're going to get, it's going to be somewhere down the snout, is the term I use, is where the main attraction point is going to be. Now if you put this at the end of a bar magnet, remember a bar magnet has a big sheet current, which is the main current. So we're, the term main current could either be the edge current of a disk magnet, or the main current can be the sheet current at the center of a bar magnet. That's a new terminology, the main current. And then you have the halo current. So what's happening is, because this is a much more powerful current, okay, but because we're looking at it from the edge, this no longer looks like a sheet current, it looks like a ring current going along the edge. That's why you have more attraction force at the edge of a magnet. And so what happens is you have this magnetization, this, this, this image current of the sheet current here. And that's attracting to the sheet current. That's the main form of force of attraction. But because this current is opposite in direction to the halo current, the halo current forces this object to pinpoint to the center. Now, then this again here. Now here's where size matters, because if you had smaller objects, oh wait, let's do the demonstration with the nail first. Okay, so what we're going to use here is this nail. I was going to file it, I wanted to use a bigger nail and then use a grinder to make the end a little more oblong, but I couldn't find a bigger nail and let's see what happens with this little nail. But basically I'm going to use the end of the nail as half of an oblong object. So if we got an edge current here, and if you try to go toward the edge current, again, like the blade, it's going to repel from the edge current. Okay, and it's going to go not necessarily toward the edge, but part of the way down the edge. Okay, if I let it stick here, let me do this so you can see this. If I let it go into the edge. See how it's kind of like, you know, if I, I have to hold up the other end of the. If this were a small little seed, that would be its best point of attraction right there. Okay, just like I demonstrated, right, right about there. Okay, but again, if I bring it up, See how it repels from the edge current because of its shape. And again, it's starting to go down the side here a little bit. Okay, but its best point of attraction is the broad side. That's the best point of attraction. That is why an oblong object wants to present its broad side to the edge current and not its pointy side. Okay, and that is the demonstration of an oblong object. Now, with a small little bar magnet, okay, if I try to go toward the end, according to the theory that I propose, it should go to a right toward the center. I'm going to try to direct it toward the edge. 
can see how it goes right toward, well, I'm mostly toward the center. I mean, this is a square magnet, not a, and these are not very well made, but it, essentially it's going to be near the center. Now, if I try to push it toward the edge, okay, they're right on the center. If I try to push it toward the edge, it's going to repel as I get toward the halo current. It does not like to be there. The best place it likes to be is toward the center. Okay, so that is showing you the bar magnet that it wants to be toward the center. Okay, that's the nail, the oblong object demonstration. Okay, so now if you take a smaller oblong object and forget, assume we, don't not, we do not have a sheet current over here. Again, just like the examples I showed you, it's going to track somewhere down along the snout. I probably should have moved that up a little bit. But somewhere between the center of the oblong and its snout, that's where the attraction point is going to be, as was demonstrated with the edge current. So if you only had the halo current, that's where this guy would attract. But once you add back in the main current, what's going to happen now is this main current is going to repel the nose. It's going to, and it's going to, the, the, between this guy's effect and this guy's effect, it's going to go about 45 degrees off the end of the bar magnet. And if you had a whole bunch of them, Okay, the smaller ones now will pick anywhere in the center over here. The big one, because it had bigger currents, wanted to go toward the center, but the little ones can be farther away from the edge current and not be as much as affected by them. So the whole bunch of little ones will come off the end, but as you get closer to the edge, they start dovetailing toward the diagonal. And then as they go around the edge here, when you get to this point here in the bar magnet, you're going to see that the force from the sheet current and the halo current balance and there's a certain point around here where they're going to go vertical and then they're going to start edging over and then as they get toward the sheet current because there's no attraction you're going to see the arc of these objects and where do you see this well you see this with the bar magnet okay so over here where the sheet current dominates because it's the most powerful current it's the main current of the magnet uh, because there's no attraction force to a sheet current, but there's a lot of magnetizing force, that's why all of these oblong objects, and that's what iron filings are, they're oblong objects. All these oblong objects are pointing their, their, their bellies toward the sheet current, and that's affecting it all the way out here. Now, as you get farther out, you start getting interactions between the iron filings because they're magnets too, because they're being magnetized here. Okay, so the farther away you get, you're starting to get interactions between the filings. Okay, but now as you get from the edge over here, you can start seeing the, the, the filings are becoming more vertical. And then they're going off the edge at 45 degrees. And as you get toward the end, they're coming off straight. And because there's more of an attraction force here, where there isn't with the sheet current, you can see it's starting to pull material away from this field. And that's why there's these more of it looks like there's missing components here. These are all being pulled in and that's why there's much more hair here because this area is pulling in. It's also pulling from the, the top over here. That's why there's a lot more fuzz here because they're all because we do have an attractive force. It is actually pulling stuff in. And that was the important realization here is the reason why this doesn't all pull in is because a sheet current has no or very little attractive force but has a very powerful magnetizing force. Now that I explained to you how oblong objects behave to magnets and magnetic fields, we're now going to discuss how the old MagnaView film works. The old MagnaView film works upon the force of magnetization. And from now on, we're going to call that the M film. And so what the M film is comprised of is a whole bunch of little cells. And inside the cell is some kind of viscous fluid and suspended in that viscous fluid is some kind of oblong object. Maybe it's an iron filing. I don't know. And so what happens is if you put this film over a magnet, and what we're showing you is the, the edge of a disc magnet, and this would be the location of the edge current going down into the page. Okay, so what happens is all of these objects want to turn their little midsection toward 
the edge current. So they're all turning their midsection toward the edge current. Now, because these guys are almost perfectly, well, they're, they're mostly flat here, they're going to be more reflective of the light that's hitting from the, the top. Because over here, these are becoming vertical, light is going to pass almost completely through because the ends are not that reflective, or they don't reflect that much. And that's why you get the bright sections in the film and the dark sections in the film. And if we put this MagnaView film over a bar magnet, well, over here, and let's assume that these iron filings were the oblong objects inside the film. Well, here, the oblong objects are showing that they're virtually flat. So there's going to be more reflection of light from the center. Over here, where the oblong objects are vertical, these are going to be very dark. Okay, let me demonstrate that with the M-type film right now. Okay, this is the Type M demonstration. What I'm going to show you again is where the edge current is, the oblong objects are broadside. And you can see the nail is shinier when you see it broadside, just as the little oblong objects are in the paper. And when I turn this point-wise, it doesn't reflect much at all. So here, the oblong objects are basically vertical with respect to the film, or actually to the camera. And therefore, you can't see anything. Now, here's an interesting phenomenon. If I bring this close, and I rock the paper. Okay, so it's important to understand that the objects in the film reflect toward the observer. So the reason why you can still see, even though I'm turning it, and that's a very steep angle, it's like 45 degrees, you can still see it, is because the little objects that are in there are staying the same orientation relative to the camera, just like the nail is right now. And that's why it doesn't really matter how you rotate the film. Okay, it's not that the it's not that the field is perpendicular to the film. It's that the camera is perpendicular to the film. So when I model this, I'm going to make it so that the 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 physics 2 film that does this is going to assume that the observer is always looking down from the top and then it's going to be, you know, the a perpendicular to the edge current is what you see. Now, here's something I want to demonstrate to you. This stuff remembers. Okay. See the halo that's there? Maybe I can do it better. See, it leaves a halo. So this stuff kind of remembers. But you can make it forget, because if I put the edge current along the edge, you see it become black. That's because the little oblong objects in the film are now pointing up and down with respect to the camera. And because of that, they have minimal reflection. Okay, so this is another verification. Again, if I go underneath, now those objects that you see in the bright spot are got their broadside toward the camera. And because of that, you have maximum reflection from the studio lights, which are above the camera. Okay. Next, I'm going to show you the little bar magnet. Again, what we said was, is that the main current, which is a sheet current along the center, doesn't have a, much attraction force, but it does have magnetizing force, and this film responds to magnetizing force. But However, over here, we have on the ends of the bar magnet, we have more of an attraction force, which is going to cause the oblong objects to go vertical toward the ends of the magnet. Okay, so there you go. At the ends of the magnet, it's black. In the center of the magnet, you can see the massive main current, which is a sheet current. Okay, so you kind of remember, I got a little imprint of the little N and the S in there. Okay, that is the Type M MagnaView film, the magnetization film that shows magnetization. Okay. Now the new film works mainly on the force of attraction. What they have are have cells, and in those cells they have material that will compress if it's magnetized. As it's compressed, it'll keep a gap between the top and the bottom that will cause an interferometry pattern. The wider the gap, the more toward you get toward red. 
But now over here where the magnetization isn't as much, you get start getting more toward the greens and the blues as you get farther away from the source. And if we were to put one of the new material, the, the M, I'm sorry, the A-type film in our bar magnet again, again, because it works on attractive force and because there's no very little attractive force where the edge current is, that's why the magnet view film shows blank, nothing. Where, where you have maximum magnification or maximum attraction, that's where you see the brighter colors in the magnet view film. I'm going to show you the A film, A type film demo right now. Okay, this is the demonstration with the A type film. This A type works mostly by attraction. I think there's another component of stuff going on here that I still have to figure out. But according to what we said in the theory, that's our little bar magnet. And in a bar magnet, the main current is a sheet current in the middle, but the sheet current can only magnetize, it can't attract. And because of that, this type of film can't see the sheet current. What it can see is the halo currents induced on the edges. When I put this over here, you'll see that. Okay, and in fact, an interesting little phenomenon here is the sheet current is inducing currents in the letters a little bit. So you can kind of see the letters there from what's being induced by the sheet current or the main current in the middle. Now, an interesting thing that I saw here is they're showing here that reason how this works. And what they're showing here is this works by attraction. So the magnetic force perpendicular to the bottom will compress these magnetizing particles, leaving a wider gap between the surface of the magnetizing particles and the surface of the film. So this is going to cause a, a what we're going to call a, a condition that favors longer wavelengths. And so that this says here, according to this theory, this should be this should be red over here, and where you have thinner, it just should be blue to black. Okay, and the, what the black is really is the black would be the higher frequencies that are beyond the visible spectrum. Okay, so that would be ultraviolet, but that should be over here according to this diagram. And that would explain why they got this backwards. However, again, when I was playing with it some more, okay, I'm going to turn it a little bit here. Okay, so you notice we have the yellow here. And then it goes black to blue to green to yellow and looks like orange out here. So this color scheme follows this color scheme. Okay, which, you know, because the, my was being confused because I see yellow here. And yellow's at the top. So something's going on. This may be a different kind of yellow. So there's another mechanism going on that we have to figure out. Okay, now that I saw this spectrum looking like this, it makes more sense why they printed it like this. But this doesn't follow this, the theory. So there's another mechanism with this film we still have to figure out, but it works mostly by attraction. Uh, thank you. That is the demonstration of the A-type film. Okay, that's all I wanted to show you. That's the addendum. It shows you more details of how the you really need both types of film to truly understand what's going on with a magnet, understand the difference in the different types of currents that are on magnets to understand the different behaviors of the different types of film. So what we're going to get into now is the Hall effect. This is chapter 6.1 of the version 5.1 paper. So if we take a current ring, a big loop of wire with a current in it, and we have a charge in the center, and it's moving, the black arrow show direction, moving in this direction. Well, because like moving currents attract, that charge is going to experience a force. The red arrows are force in this direction. Okay, if that charge were moving to the right, okay, it would have the same direction as this, an anti-direction of this, so the force would be up. And you can work out all the other forces. We call this symbol the force rose. Okay, basically, if you had a charged particle moving in here, it would always be going force in the right angle to the direction it's moving, and it would take a curved path around this area. 
Okay, this is used for what's known as cloud chambers. Cloud chambers, I mean, people focus on the cloud chamber. The cloud chamber is a way to see the path trajectory of charged particles. But what they forget to tell you is this whole area is got a Helmholtz coil creating a very powerful magnetic field in over the cloud chamber. And that's what's causing charged particles to take curved paths. Now, as the particles slow down, the, the diameter of their rings get smaller and smaller and smaller until they lose all of their velocity. The straight lines here are particles who are neutrally charged. And because of that, there's no net force on them and they pass completely through. Okay, this is one of the important discoveries uh, for atomic physics and all that other stuff. But now, what if, what if we had a conductor? What if we had a, a, a current fragment in here and it had a current going this direction? Well, you would think if you had the case that the current would be bunched up, be under that same force, it would be bunched up toward the left side of the conductor, right? You would think that. It's simple. It's logical. And then what you could do is put a little voltmeter and measure the voltage difference between both sides of that conductor. And this is, in fact, called the Hall effect or the Hall voltage. Just, and and I, I shouldn't use the term discovered by Edwin Hall. More important, he just didn't discover it. He reasoned it out. Okay, this is back in the days when physicists actually had big throbbing brains and they could figure things out from the basic concepts. All right, and look at this. Edwin Hall then explored the question of whether magnetic fields interact with the conductors or the electric charge and reasoned, he didn't discover, he reasoned that if the force were specifically acting on the current, it should crowd the current to one side of the wire, producing a small measurable voltage. And he did this working on his doctoral degree at John Hopkins University. This is the golden age of physics, when physicists had big throbbing brains and could reason out from the fundamental physics what should be going on. Okay, not like today where they have the dark age of physics where, well, we have the dark age of physics now where if you even question existing stuff, you will be canceled. And I'll leave it at that. Horrible way for us to be doing physics. Okay, so to do the derivation for the Hall effect, what we need to do is go back to video EM04 underscore 06, the interfragmentary VIM. Now, Patreon members saw this about a year ago. YouTubers saw it a couple weeks ago. We want to go specifically to slide number nine. Okay, on slide nine, you will find this model. And what we do, this is the actual slide nine from that video. In here, you will find this special term. This is what we call the Hall effect term. Now, this M over here is not magnetizing torque. This is the magnetic force per coulomb. I'll say that again. It's the magnetic force per coulomb in the target. Okay, and this was derived by taking the previous model and, and computing both the effect of the moving and the stationary charges on the moving charges in the target loop. And the interesting part about this is the, for, the direction of this effect is perpendicular to the face of the wire. So this is definitely our Hall effect. Now, for the rest of this, we are not going to consider the velocity of the target wire and the velocity of the source wire. So on the next slide, we're going to drop this out. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take a ring of wire that has a current in it, and we're going to put our target conductor at the center of that ring. Now, this target here is much, much smaller than the ring, but I've got it large enough so you can see it in uh, for, uh, graphically so that's why it's kind of bigger than it really should be for this so it really should be very tiny now what we see here in this model is that we see that this vortex this is the operation of the source on the target this is a vortex mech matrix and the amplitude of this matrix is these guys their their magnitudes multiplied divided by the magnitude of r so that's the magnitude effect on this component over here. Now the directional components is R right divided into the direction of the current in the source. Okay, so the way that works out is that's going to be a rotation from the direction of R to the direction of the source current. So if you look at this guy over here, the current moving through this part of the wire 
is moving vertical in the y direction and the direction to the target is in the x direction. So the rotation from R to the direction of the source current is a positive 90 degrees. And if you look at all the rotations around every fragment, every point around this curve, it's all 90 degree positive rotation. Therefore, that rotation gets applied to the direction of the target current. A positive 90 degree rotation is where the force per coulomb is going to be affected on that charge. And because this target charge is moving in the positive y direction, therefore the force per coulomb is going to be in the negative x direction acting on that target charge. I'm showing the arrow outside the wire. This really should be inside the wire. I just didn't want to obstruct all of this stuff in here. But this current is in the wire, of course, not to be confused. Okay, but because this entire ring can be just simplified down to, okay, if we take all this stuff, we can remove all the vector stuff and just put multiply the length of the loop times the current in the loop, uh, and that would simplify all this down, and we can make a, a simple scalar equation out of it. And the loop length is basically 2 pi r, and these one of this r cancels with one of this r, and then we get the force per coulomb acting on the charges in the target over here. And so this is going to be our Hall effect force per coulomb. That's the way that M is defined. And because we got rid of all the vortex, this is basically a scalar equation right now, making life simple for us. So in order to convert this force per coulomb into a vim, we have to multiply both sides by the width of the wire. Because the width of the wire is in the direction that the m vector is. Okay, so we multiply that and then we can reduce. I forgot to remove. We can remove one of these guys here. Okay, but let's do this for the sake of, let's, we want to match classical theory to show that we get the same answer that classical theory does. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, all the components up here that are the source of the magnetic field and we want to move them into a blue B. Now this isn't Burl, because Burl would be a black B. This is a legacy field model, the B field model, and that would be Km times the current in the source times 2 pi times the radius of the source divided by R squared, and those two R's cancel. So now that are all the components that are affecting our loop on the target. If you actually derive this from classical theory using the donut shaped model, you will get the exact same answer that we get with the spherical model and I have explained why that is. This is one of the cases where they get the same answers. Okay, and then if we abstract all of these components out of here, you end up with that the VIM or EMF that you measure across the width of the wire is your magnetic field contribution times the current in the target times the width of the target divided by the charge. This is the conduction charge of the target per unit meter. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to replace this QTPM with something similar to what they use. Okay, they use the conduction charges in the target per meter cubed. Okay, so QTPM is derived from this value by multiplying it by the width and times the height, the thickness. And that's how you get QTPM. Basically it's Q the charges per the charge per unit volume times a cross-sectional area, which is width times thickness. So we're going to replace TPM out. We end up with this. The W's cancel, and we're left with this. Now let's see how that stacks up with classical theory. Okay, classical theory, if you go on Wikipedia, they write it like this. For them, N is the charge carrier density. That's the number of carriers per unit volume. And E is the charge per carrier in coulombs. So N times E is identical to our QTM3, which is the coulombs per cubic meter, the, the conduction coulombs per cubic meter. Okay, so if we replace legacy, those N, E with those, we bring it down, you have pretty much the same thing. They got the little X's and the Z's for... To, you know, being careful about their dimensions, that's fine. It, it works out the same for us. We get the exact same answer. 
Okay. So normally I would not spend valuable time on an experiment if we obtain the same answers as classical theory. However, one of my Patreon members named Tibor brought to my attention a Hall effect experiment anomaly. Researchers experimenting with Hall effect apparatus experience a negative Hall voltage when using zinc as the Hall target. We call that the zinc anomaly, and that's something we're going to have to test to make sure that we can see the zinc anomaly, and then we would have to explain it with new electromagnetism V5. Um, the status of this experiment is, is this is considered a fringe experiment. Mainstream science is ignoring this because, oh, this stuff is settled, the science is settled, so these people must have done something wrong. That's, again, the reason why... Uh, let's go on. So we're adding the Hall, we're call, giving it the code name Halsey for the Hall Zinc experiment. Uh, we're gonna have a full list of the experiments that are in the pipeline and that is going to be in the conclusion video. Uh, there's much more work to be done on NEV5 and that work will continue after we get the cosmology stuff out of the way. Okay, so for physics two, we don't presently have a Hall junction in the software. Uh, we were gonna add that to the Hall. I was gonna add that to the software when we get to the Hall Z experiments. But for now, what you could do is you could put a current ring in the software with a good with a known current, and then take a small current uh, fragment here and give it a velocity. Okay, and the way you would compute that effective velocity is you take your, your Vim and you take F equals Q V cross B, okay, whatever. Uh, variables are in different orders, but we're doing this all scalar, so it doesn't matter. And then we convert this to Vim by dividing both sides by Q and then multiplying by the length of that little fragment there. Okay, and then what we do is we set the Vims equal to each other, and then we derive the velocity. Now, this velocity is an effective velocity. It's not actually the velocity of the charge carriers. Okay. This T over here is the thickness of the Hall target that you're using. QTM3 would be the conduction charge per unit volume of the Hall target that you are considering. But this L here is the length of the fragment. It's not necessarily the, the width of the Hall target because the width of the Hall target does not affect this. This is basically uh, used for simulation purposes. And then you would give that simulation value a, t a current and this would be the velocity that you put in for the speed of that fragment. Okay, now with all this said, I got to the feeling, why bother? I mean, we have all the equations here. You can just put them in a spreadsheet and get an answer. Okay, so I mean, there's no really need to simulate them when you can just dump these into a spreadsheet and get your answer to your heart's content for any experiment you want to do. So I didn't bother. I set it up enough to get this nice picture, but I didn't actually, I, as I was writing out the equations to compute what velocity to use for that, I realized this is kind of pointless. You just put this stuff into the into a spreadsheet, and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so our path forward, I slipped again. Sorry, but this video took me a lot longer than I expected. I'm gonna try to get out um, the conclusion look ahead tomorrow using Labor Day. I'm only going to get half the day because I have to start traveling for work. Okay, um, NEV5, I'm sorry, I didn't make this date for the 5.1 paper release. I'm getting to the point where I've released pretty much everything in the 5.1 paper in the video series. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe I should just um, not release this. I'm going to put a thing out for Patreon members. Uh, why waste time on this when we can just say the videos are pretty much, the videos and the 5.0 paper pretty much cover the 5.1. Okay, and we might as well just uh, put all that effort into getting the 5.2 complete after cosmology. Okay, so I'm gonna put a, a feeler out for the Patreon how they wanna handle that if they're still anxious to see a 5.1 paper. Um, anyway, the updated punch list, now we have the Hall effect. Now the reason why I do not have anything in here is because I had not gotten to the point of considering Hall effect for the older models because there were just so many other things that had to be resolved here. So no sense working on this until we had all this resolved. Ethereumechanics.com will get you to the Premier YouTube channel. All our premieres when we have them are Thursday nights at 9 o'clock. 
Here you will find all the released videos, and I will put them in order once the, once the, the series is done. This is the main repository. Once I'm done releasing all the new Electromagnetism V5 videos, I will update this and put all the links to the YouTube in order so you can watch them in order instead of having to go find them on YouTube. This is the reason why we need to develop faster than light Starship. We need to get at least 500 times the speed of light or we are a dead species. This is the blog site. Big shout outs for Sebastian for hosting this. Again, when I get more time, when I get past all this stuff and I'll be able to spend more time on here. Right now, I'm every moment of time that I have is just trying to get this stuff and the science and the videos done. I apologize. Uh, this is the Patreon site. You'll st see stuff at least four weeks, in many cases years, before stuff I make public. And anybody that's going to be $20 and above will have access to the Physics 2 software. Thank you. No more voodoo physics.